try to move, but you can't. You start to feel that pressure to build in your chest and it feels like the walls are closing in around you. Your natural instincts tell you to fight harder, but it seems like the more you fight, the worse it gets. But you keep fighting and you keep clawing, and then you realize you're trapped. You realize that there, there's no way that you can get out of it on your own. It's a bad feeling. It's a scary feeling. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Later on in verse 12, he says that we were living with no hope and without God in the world. See, all of you have been in hopeless situations. You've been in situations that you looked around and you evaluated it and you tried to find a way. But it seemed like the harder you tried, the deeper it got. It seemed like the more you did, the worse the situation became. It was hopeless. It's a bad feeling. It's a sad feeling. But it's a beautiful feeling when you realize that you have somebody waiting to save you from being trapped. When you realize we have a Savior who saved us when we were trapped. He saved us when we were dead and there was nothing that we could do on our own. The Summer Olympics are coming up and I know y'all are going to be shocked, but I didn't qualify. Uh, and, and probably unless this thing is really blown up, and I hope it has, I doubt there are any Olympic qualifiers in our audience. You see, no matter how hard I work, no matter how much I do, I'm never going to qualify for the Olympics. So my favorite event is the 100 meter. And you can imagine me lining up and I'm getting ready to run the race. And I show up and everybody is laughing because I run a six flat, flat 40. Uh, and I show up and I line down and Usain Bolt, he sees me and he walks over to me and he says, Bo, step up, I've got you. He says, step up, I've got you covered. So he looks at me and he realizes that there's no way I'm going to be able to qualify on my own. See, so that's the same way our God is with us. Paul said in Colossians 1 and verse 12 that we have a father who qualifies us. See, so in those situations where there is no way for us, we serve a God who makes a way for us. You see, we struggle a lot. We struggle a lot with the fight because it's kind of in our makeup to want to fight, uh, to want to put all of our effort and all of our energy towards everything because most situations that we're in in life that are bad, that are tough, that are a struggle, we can bring ourselves out of. Most of the time, if we fight hard enough, if we work hard enough, we can go from bad to better. But Paul didn't say that we were bad in our trespasses. Paul said we were dead in our trespasses. You see, and dead people, no matter how much we'd like it, they can't do it for themselves. They have to be rescued. In the next verse in Colossians 1 and verse 13 Paul tells us that we were rescued from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. You see, so you imagine this domain of darkness, uh, a darkness to the point of, of real black, of real darkness, and there's no hope. There's no option anywhere around us. We can't even see where we would want to start. And we serve a God who swoops down and he saves us from the darkness when we can't save ourselves. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says that it's, we're saved by grace, not of ourselves. It's not about how great you are, but it says it's a gift of God. That it's not about how great you are. It's not about how talented you are. It's not about how talented I am, and I'm grateful for that. It's about how wonderful and loving the God is that we serve. See, I, when we're changed, when we're rescued, there should be a real change in us. There should be a difference in the way that we live our life. There should be a difference in the way we look at people around us. I think back to 2002, and I know most of y'all were pretty young then, uh, but I was a sophomore in college. And I was driving back from Nashville, and I remember getting off the interstate. I got off the interstate right out here on Saturn Parkway, and it was two o'clock in the morning, and I was really tired. I'd fallen asleep at a friend's apartment, and I remember reaching down and I picked up a sun drop and, and I had an unopened sun drop and I went to twist the cap off. And as I went to twist the cap off, I said, no, 
I can do this on my own. I'll be okay. And I put it back down. And that's the last thing that I remember before I felt a jerk in the road and I opened my eyes and there was a telephone pole about two inches from the front of my car. And all I had time to do as time slowed down for a second was to pop the clutch and squint my eyes and I felt the impact and I realized I was still moving. That I wasn't wrapped around a telephone pole, that the pole had broken off at the base and flipped over my car. I went down in a ditch, back up onto the road, and I hopped out of the car and I started patting myself. I started checking my legs and checking my arms because I knew something had to be broken, something had to be wrong. But I didn't have a scratch on me. I'd been rescued. So I went back the next day and I grabbed a piece of the telephone pole. And I, I took it with me because think is y'all can relate you've been saved in some way and when you're rescued in some way it does change us it does change us into a different person at least temporarily and we have to keep reminders of our rescue around us if we don't keep reminders around us all the time it's so easy to go back to living the exact same life to go back to forgetting about the fact that we were dead and now we're alive there was another perspective of that wreck. One of my best friends was traveling right behind me. He was coming to spend the night at my house. And he watched as I slowly drifted off the road. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew I'd fallen asleep. He saw as I was drifting off the road and headed towards the telephone pole, and there was nothing he could do about it. He said it was one of the scariest moments of his life that he thought he was watching one of his best friends die. You see, and we would say that when we're rescued, it changes us. I would say that rescued people rescue people. That it changes the way we look at the people around us. But I wonder if we're doing the same thing most of our time. We're riding behind our friends, and we're watching them as they fall asleep at the wheel of life. As they drift off to the right, as they're going in a bad direction, and we hate it, we despise it, but we don't hate it enough to do something about it. In Jude 23, he describes it as snatching some from the fire. It's this imagery of urgency, that, that you go at it with such ferocity that, that you go at it to save them. Most of the time when we want to go and rescue somebody, we, we make a plan. And, and we, we make sure that it's the easiest way and it's the best way possible and that nobody's going to be hurt in the situation. But the imagery he portrays here is one of snatching them. You think about snatching somebody from the fire and somebody falls in the fire, you don't sit back and look at them and say, well, I know I should save them, but, but let me take a minute and evaluate what the best situation is. Uh, let me make sure that I don't reach in and get burned while I'm doing that. Let me make sure that while I'm going at them, that I don't hurt them along the way, that they don't get angry with me. No, you snatch them from the fire, you rescue them from the fire, and they're eternally grateful to you. Rescued people, rescue people. And rescued people understand that they're rescued with a purpose. See, so a lot of times we treat it like we're rescued and, and we just go back to our normal life. God didn't send His Son, this earth, for us to live a normal life. God sent His Son to rescue us for a purpose. One of my favorite stories of rescuing the Bible is the prodigal son, and as y'all know it very well, the younger son, he decides to leave home, take his inheritance, and he goes off and he lives a life of bad choices. He lives a life of sinful choices, of choices that lead him to pain and heartache and hurt his family. Choices a lot like the ones some of y'all are making. A lot like the ones some of y'all have made. And, and he gets to this point where he hits rock bottom and he has this moment where he realizes that, hey, my father's servants are in a better situation than I am. I just hope that I can go back and have what they have. But you know how it goes. As he's coming home, his father sees him and his father runs to him. His father embraces him. His father throws a party for him. They celebrate the fact that he's back. But his other brother, who had stayed, he comes in from the field and he sees what's going on and he's standing outside the party and he refuses to go into the celebration. His father comes out. And he says to his father, I've been here the whole time. I never left you. I never betrayed you. I served you this whole time. And his father says, son, 
All that I have is yours. But your brother was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. See, we can spend so much time dwelling on the past, dwelling on our past mistakes like the younger brother, maybe dwelling on our past successes like the older brother. We spend so much time focusing on past failures and success, and we need to be like this father and understand that we need to celebrate the presence and focus on the future. If you understand that you're rescued with a purpose, it's going to change the way you live. You're not going to live a life of complacency. You're not going to live a normal life. You're going to live a life of urgency. Understand that you were rescued with a purpose. It's an amazing feeling. Amazing feeling to have those chains fall off, to drop the chains, uh, to be in this situation where you're trapped, where you're stuck, and, and the chains fall off and you're free. So a lot of times what we do is we take the chains off only to put new ones on. We, we put on the chain of, I've got to earn it. Oh, we pick up the chain and we put on the chain of, my past is still there. We put on the chain of, I'm not worthy to be rescued. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what you have to understand is God didn't just rescue you one day. He rescues you every single day. So you have an option. You can wake up every day and you can put on your chains. And what's going to happen is you're going to be weighed down. You're going to be beaten down. It's going to be heavy in the same way and you're going to feel trapped. It's probably going to eventually break you. Or you can wake up and you can recognize that you were dying. Now check that. You were dead and God rescued you.